Yo, this is Mike, Ringmaster of the Imagination Circus, and I'm here for another episode of Why I Ship It. Back to Ruby ships, but we're doing something a little bit different. I know, I'm only, this is only the fourth episode, but we're already doing something different, but hey, I like to mix things up. I want to keep you interested. So I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to examine what we're going to be calling the Blake Belladonna Harem. And what do I mean by this? Well, despite, despite the fact that every character has been more or less shipped with every other character from Ruby, the fact is that old Blake Belladonna seems to have more ships than any other member of her team. No, that's not right. Not more than more ships than any other member of her team, but more ships that seem to have a possibility of being canon or having been canon. And as such, I will be going over those characters and their potential chemistry with Blake, who I ship her with, so why I feel strongly or not so strongly about the ship when it comes to dear old Blake, who I genuinely ship her with, and going forward, who I'd like to see her with, and why I do or do not feel that these characters make sense with her in particular. So let's get started, shall we? I'm sexy and I know it. Alright, first off is one Sun Wukong. Based on the ancient Monkey King from the Journey to the West, we shall be seeing whether or not he has the chemistry to be with Blake. The answer is yes, he has the chemistry. However, he's not my primary ship with Blake, even though they do have a great slew of moments, especially after the combination of volumes four and five. But for me, it just doesn't work. And again, we're doing something a little bit different here because unlike with most of the other ships I've done, you know, we, we have actual almost genuine romantic chemistry going on. Uh, but the showrunners, Miles and Carrie, have specifically pointed out that going forward, these are characters who are growing up, who are coming of age, but and are experiencing life as teenagers, and therefore, yeah, feelings shift. You don't always stay in the same relationship. You don't always keep the same feelings you had when you were 17 from the time to when you were 20. And trust me, as someone who is currently 22, I can say that for a fact. Now, in this case... These two work pretty well together. Sun, you know, has a nice kind of balance with Blake's, you know, more somber, more pessimistic, realistic personality, whereas he's energetic, fun-loving, and growing up in a place like Vacuo, from what we've heard about it, yeah, the fact that he, you know, is the way he is isn't really all that surprising. So the fact that they work so well as kind of almost opposites attract works. And while I hate to bring this up, it doesn't hurt that he's the one of the few, like, granted, majority of uh, of Blake's other romantic prospects, ah, prospects are also Faunus, but it doesn't hurt that he's a Faunus. I'm just saying. Blake, despite her, you know, wanting equality with humanity, even though technically speaking, since humans and Faunus can breed, it means that they're technically the same species anyway, but I digress. The point of the matter is that Blake, being a Faunus, would probably feel slightly more comfortable being in a relationship with another Faunus, if only for the approval of her, of the, her fellow Faunus. Because let's be honest, Blake definitely has some insecurities, and part of that is, you know, her being so close to other, to humans, the way she is. I mean, I really would have loved to have seen, because there's no way this didn't happen, but we will probably never see it. I would love to have seen what the, the meeting between the Belladonnas, uh, Blake's parents, and the rest of Team Ruby would have been like, not to mention someone like Crow, because come on, that had, to, like, they're not going to sign off on their daughter going off in this whirlwind adventure to save the world they don't grant it they don't have complete authority over her at this point but still they wouldn't have approved if 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 they didn't at least get to meet these people and i would have loved to have seen that interaction i think everybody would have but regardless sun works in a in a weird way just because he is the opposite and in, a, in an interesting way uh, Blake and Sun are almost a weird reflection of uh, her parents, with Sun being like Kali and Blake being more like Yira. 
their, you know, a slightly more reserved commanding presence who doesn't talk unless absolutely necessary or absolutely when they aren't and only to people they generally care about whereas the other is a slightly more lively enjoying life kind of person who is also a little goofy and can do stuff like this <laughs> son oh dear oh, oh, look at that. Whoa. this isn't Wait. the bathroom uh, i'll just be going sorry to interrupt Come, this tender family please. moment <laughs> yeah when you do something like that then, yeah, that kind of solidifies the similarities. Um, regardless, these two work well together, and we have just such a great slew of moments. And, and like I said, just a lot more than a lot of the other characters I've talked about in the past on this show. Like, for instance... I mean... You know, it's true, it's not entirely clear how interested she actually is, but when you flirt with somebody the moment you see them, well, and that's what this is. Maybe he knew she was a faunus. In fact, it's pretty clear he knew she was a faunus, but he's flirting with her. Something that we haven't really seen du Sun do with any other characters, despite being on a team with the one dude who seems to flirt with all of the girls. Oh, man. <sighs> I don't know if we'll ever have Neptune on this show, but if we do, oh man, do I have some things to say about that boy. That stupid, stupid, lovely blue-haired boy. Okay, moving on. So yeah, these moments just kind of add up, and they make it seem like these two really, really work together. So, yeah, all of these moments combined with their disparate personalities and the similarities to Blake's parents uh, just me make it seem like they're a pretty good couple. And honestly, while they're not my favorite Blake ship, they're definitely high up there. I'm not going to lie. I do like me a bit of Black Sun. Moving on. Alright, look, I have to... <sighs> Look, like I said, I kind of have to talk about why I do or do not ship something. I kind of shipped Sun and Blake. I, it's not my primary ship, but it is a ship that I somewhat support and I'm totally okay with it being canon. This next ship, on the other hand, I'm only talking about it because I'm pretty sure there's at least a small minority of people who do kind of see this. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm pretty sure this was a thing, but we're not talking about it being a thing in the past. We're talking about it, how it might, like, there's a possibility of these two getting back together. And I don't see it happening just because the guy's kind of a dick. Yeah, we're talking about these two. Hello, my darling. Adam Taurus. Adam Taurus. You know, every, I don't hate characters often. The short, it's a very short list. Like, Seriously, let me put, I'll put the list right, this is the list of people, characters I genuinely hate. Yeah, it's a really short list, isn't it? This, this bullheaded, literally a figure to leave, this bullheaded mother. <sighs> yeah, I know. More than, I don't know what it is, but, you know, with, maybe I'll make a video about this in the future, why I hate these characters in particular. Because, yeah, I don't hate the other villains of the show. You know, I do not hate Tyrion, who is surprisingly entertaining. I do not hate Hazel, who has a somewhat sympathetic backstory and is kind of badass. I do not hate, I do not hate Watts, mostly because he hasn't really done anything worth hating him over just yet. If anything, he's an intriguing character because we don't know anything or much about him just yet. Uh, he's the one member of hey, Salem's court we don't know about. And then, of course, Salem, we just learned a whole lot about her and her true personality and her insights and her want for freedom and her dark power. And if anything, she just became a slightly more compelling, slightly more dangerous villain. And I liked her from the moment she was introduced. So, yeah. Uh, but, but Adam... Adam Torres. Honestly, I didn't give much thought to Adam. And again, I only got into I got into volume the like Ruby around volume three. I managed to finish it right around the time the last chapter was premiered. 
And, you know, and I never gave much thought to Adam because I got into it. I watched the first episode, the first few episodes, actually, first. And then when I heard, and then I found out about the trailers, watched those, briefly saw Adam and moved forward. And then, of course, Adam came back at the end of Volume 2. But it's like we had not seen anything from him really yet. You know, we didn't really know his personality, except that he was willing to kill humans because he hated them that much. We just didn't know much about him. And then the end of Volume 3 happened, with all its pain and suffering, that it not only brought on the characters, but brought on us, the audience, as well. And we were introduced to Adam fully. And he's a dick! He's... I hate him so much! He's vindictive, possessive. He clearly was abusive towards Blake. Like, the relationship they had clearly was the very emotion, Maybe not physically, but emotionally abusive, which is just as valid and just as painful. And it infuriates me that, I like, Blake, I had problems with. Her running away from her problems, I couldn't stand... But damn it if I'm not going to feel sorry for her knowing that she was ever partners, and probably more. It's never been outright stated, but it's been more or less implied that these two were together, and that just makes it worse. I hate him. I hate him so much. <sighs> he's, and maybe the reason I hate him is because he's real. You know what I mean? We, as people, are more than likely to encounter real awful people. Not the kind of people like Watts, who we, again, we don't understand yet. Tyrion, who's just kind of crazy. Hazel, who has some sort of sympathetic reason for what he's doing, but he's still doing something terrible. Or Salem, who's Salem, you know. I, I mean, yeah. But Adam is too real. And I think that might be the reason why I hate him. It's probably not why the reason why I hate all of these characters, well, except maybe Dio. He he's prob I probably hate him that much because Dio. But gosh darn it, I really, really hate Adam Taurus, and I think it's just because he's that too real for me. I couldn't stand it. I don't like him. I hope he gets his come up and I hope that I hope that Blake and uh, Yang tag team his ass and take him out and mm, I hate him so much. He doesn't deserve to die. He does. He doesn't deserve the mercy of death. He deserves to be locked up somewhere, prison or some sort of asylum. I don't care. Or I don't know. Maybe he'll die by. I'll even accept him dying by Salem's hands because whatever death she, she'd give him would probably be way more satisfying than even whatever punishment Yang and Blake come up with. Because I'm just that sadistic and I hate him just that much. I think I've proven my point. Moving on! Where can I find a woman like that? Ilya Amatola. Uh, yeah, it took me a second. I had to remember how to pronounce that. Uh, which, now, also, like, can I just bring this up real quick? Am I the only one who got a kick out of the fact that her last name means rainbow and she turned out to be a lesbian? Because that's great. That's just great. It's not even funny or fun. It's just great. I, I, and it's like, it's almost exactly like what they did with, uh, with Vernal making Vernal, you know, the, the, uh, scapegoat, the red herring for being the, the spring maiden and, and placing all of these clues, making us really think she was the spring maiden. And, and despite the laying enough down that, yeah, maybe someone could have figured out that she wasn't really a spring maiden, but man, I, I like so yeah, the fact that they laid this one off in plain sight as well, just the, the rainbow thing. <sighs> you magnificent people. I was going to say people the whole time. You can't prove I wasn't. Miles, Terry, my, my man. Oh my god, I don't know how long you plan to have this character, but that's just fantastic. I love it. Regardless, yeah, she's gay and in love with Blake. Ilya, please! You don't have to do this. This isn't you. Yes, it is. But I guess back then you were just too busy falling for Adam to notice. I was always jealous of the way you looked at him. I wanted you to look at me that way. But we can't always get what we want. Again, why does everybody want Blake? I don't understand it. But, 
but she's in love with Blake. And I personally do not ship these two together. I kind of like the I I kind of like the idea of it, but the reason it doesn't work is for a couple of reasons. But let's go over what I like about Ilya as a character because I do like her. Uh, for one, she was introduced as an interesting uh, antagonist who had a history with Blake. She had a simple yet effective design. You know, it's a good design, but there just ain't a lot going on with it. But that almost what it makes it work. You know, from her skin tone to the her to the shape of her eyes to just her ability to change colors, which is not her semblance. We don't even know what her semblance is. No, that's her fauna's feature that, like a chameleon that she's based off, she can change her skin and her hair and her eyes and even just the tone of her freckles against her skin. That is freaking brilliant and I love it, though it really does make me want to know what her semblance is because it's like combined with that, she's practically, she's OP as it is. She's really good. And she actually has a fair, like, not the most similar, but she actually has a fairly similar uh, fighting style to Blake and it makes sense. The two were more or less raised together in the White Fang after her and the unfortunate death of Ilya's parents. The two became close. They were probably trained together. I'm wondering by who, because I don't think it was Kali or Gira. Gira knows how to fight, but he uses his brute strength and his claws to fight. And uh, Kali seems to be... Well, she doesn't seem to have like any existing skill. Don't get me wrong. I love... Mrs. Belladonna. She is awesome, but let's be honest, you don't ought to, you if you know how to fight, you don't go straight for the for the for the uh tea tray to beat someone over the head with. Granted, that was awesome, but still. Still. The point is, I I should be talking about Ilya, but I get sidetracked so easily. Point is, I really like Ilya, but I don't love her in a ship with Blake. And the reason for that is simply put. If she were to end up with Blake, despite her feelings, and I think a part of her has definitely moved past that, even if she still does love Blake, maybe still more than a friend, but she cares about her as a friend. I like uh, Ilya because she was, a, she was a conflicted character. Yes, she had anger. Yes, she was willing to go towards violence. Yes, she didn't feel bad when she broke those girls who laughed at her parents' unfortunate deaths. She broke their teeth. And I'm gonna be honest, I probably do the same, but the fact is that Ily, Ilya was not a, you know, she had her problems, but she was young, confused, she didn't know what to do. She said it herself. She didn't want to hurt anybody, but she was willing to because it got the results she wanted to make the faunus be treated better. And when you're young and, you know, you, like, everything's been taken from you, in First her parents, then her best friend, and everything that ha was happening in the White Fang. Yeah, it makes sense, the, the path she went down. But the reason I don't think she works with Blake is because, is because it would essentially, one, Blake is just not attracted to her. Yeah, they're good friends, and it's good to see them be friends again. But the fact is that, you know, it's so one-sided, and Blake just doesn't have that going for her. Plus, it would seem almost like a reward for changing, like, her... You know, her stance in life for going to the good side, for teaming up with Blake and Gira and Kali and defending Haven. It's in, and, and she, you know what? I Ilya made a lot of mistakes. And in the real world, world, she'd probably go to prison, if not juvenile hall, depending on the legality and area of laws that her juris the jurisdiction of her crimes fell under. But the point is, she would be in prison. And because this is remnant, and because this is a different world, and because it was a very personal matter, Blake decided not to press charges. He, she decided to forgive her, to give her a second chance. And that's fantastic, and I like that, and I think that's a great message. Because even if you someone does do something wrong and has to go to prison for it, that doesn't mean you can't forgive them. I'm not saying you have to. I'm not saying you should. I'm just saying that, that if you feel that you can do it, it's something... Maybe I don't know. I don't know. I'm 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 a believer in second chances and whatnot and stuff like that. I'm I'm a sap like that. But the point I'm trying to make is Ilya is a great character because of these things, and I love her. And, but it just wouldn't work between her and Blake. I think that right now, honestly, I almost feel like she would make more sense to be shipped with uh, Yang than with Blake. You know what I mean? Because I can honestly feel some... I don't know why <laughs> my brain goes there, but that's something that 
came into my mind and I could actually see it kind of being a thing, even though it's not going to be a thing because, let's be honest, she's too much of a secondary character to end up with any of our main characters. I know that sounds kind of harsh. It, I, it could happen. I could totally be wrong. This show has proven me wrong before. I'm just, I'm talking out of my butt. The point is, I love these two uh, uh, as individuals, but I can't see them being together. I really do like Ilya. And honestly, I would can I really hope we see more of her because I got really Ilya, attached please. to her and I felt for her. And that moment this, this where you. she revealed that she was in love with Blake was one of my favorite moments in the entire series. I, guess back then I felt that emotion. I felt so notice. bad for her. The delivery of her lines in that moment was fantastic. The there are so many things I love about that that whole thing. I, I have another I, uh, another Ruby video idea that I might be doing soon. But we can't I hope you're all interested because that, that that one's gonna be uh, kind of interesting. So yeah, moving on. Alright, the final ship, the big one, the one you've all been waiting for, assuming you've been waiting for it, and may or may not ship it like I do, Bumblebee. Yeah, we're talking about Bumblebee. Yeah, come on, guys. I don't know how many of you genuinely ship it, but then again, B Bumblebee probably is the strongest ship in the entirety of this fandom, so what am I even saying? It's probably, most of him. you probably appreciate this ship more than any other that I ship. And again, this is the real Blake ship that I ship. More than the possibility of Sun, not even with the case of Adam and Ilya, eh, it could happen, but I'm not banking on it. I'm not into it. But these two, Yang Xiaolong and Blake Belladonna, these two are fantastic and I don't know where to begin with these two. Well, maybe I do. All right, let's give it a try anyway. So Blake and Yang start out kind of not getting along. Hell, Yang calls her a lost cause during their first interaction. And I can't imagine that that when, like, Blake, knowing her personality, probably took that to heart. Again, she didn't care about Ruby or Yang or Weiss at the time, but I'm sure it affected her. And then, of course, the argument happened, and I have no doubt she continued reading after blowing out the damn candles because, you know, Faunus. And also, I really, again, the impl that is the implication there once we learn that she's a Faunus, that she, that she was secretly still reading. Uh, <laughs> and honestly, what better way to finish, like, that is the perfect way to end that episode and that argument. Today, Manya Feek. I love it. I love it. But going forward, the two ended up be partners. And clearly, Yang isn't one to hold a grudge because even though calling she called her lost cause the night before, she doesn't seem to care much that she ended up partnered with Blake. She tried to get along with her. She asks what Blake apparently considers an obvious question when they finally do get to the to the beaten down old temple where the relics are hidden, the uh, artifacts. Going forward, we really didn't get to see a lot of them in uh, Volume 1, because Volume 1 focused on other relationships, like the relationship between Ruby and Weiss. Makes sense. The relationship between uh, Jean and Ruby, along with Jean and the rest of Team Juniper. Makes sense. The relationship between, uh, like, and of course the relationship between Jean and Pyrrha. Can't not bring up that, but of course, then of course, the relationship between Weiss and, and Blake later down at the end of the first volume. Those were the focus points. So we didn't really get to see a lot of Blake and Yang together during that first volume. And, you know, maybe the ship started there, but something tells me it started a little bit, little bit later, specifically when we get to volume two. There's a lot, you know, going on in volume two. It's a lot more packed, if you ask me. And it definitely forwards the story a little bit more, especially with what we're going to get later and we get this whole, what is basically the dance arc, if you will. The ball arc. We, 
Again, I, I, I feel weird using the word arc when that's also Jean's last name, but you know what I mean. We basically get the uh, the uh, dance storyline. We get, you know, them managing to stop, you know, destroy a paladin and some, and whatnot, but they didn't really solve any of the problems yet. They hadn't really done anything. Granted, they wouldn't really do anything by the end of the volume, too, even though they thought they had, because, well, when you've got evil masterminds with a really layered plan, winning isn't really winning, you know? Anyway... Anyway, uh, they, like, Blake has not been sleeping, she's, like, you know, her grades are slipping, she's sleep-deprived, I basically already said that, but you get my point, she's got bags under her eyes, she's grumpy, and, yeah, basically, she's grumpy like that, but, the regardless, she just doesn't want to deal with anybody, and because of that, you know, like, everybody's worried about her, they thinks she needs to just relax. She doesn't want, you know, she, she just needs to lighten up a bit, get some sleep, try and enjoy herself, try and relax, you know, just chill for a bit. That's all they want. They, they're worried about her. They care about her. And what happens? We get everybody else trying to figure out how to get her to the dance, but who's adamant that she will absolutely been, be there? And, well, what do we get? Yang Xiao Long, partner of the year here because she pulls it off and damn does she ever. We get some fantastic stuff from her. We get, uh, like, not just her caring and emotional side, the side we hadn't really been introduced to yet, but the truest layer of her personality. The fact that she is something of an overprotective mother hen who cares about her team, and cares about her family, and can get emotional because of it. She likes to party. She likes to live life free and, you know, f from, you know, flowing from the seat of her pants, even though she doesn't technically wear pants. Well, at least not in at this point in time, down the line. But the point is, she tells Blake like it is. She lays it down flat that honestly in her current state she wouldn't be able to do anything even if she did have something on Torchwick or the rest of the White Fang. She is tired. She's beaten down and as someone who has stayed far awake far too long in the past, maybe fairly recently actually, and has seen the uh, what the sleep the, <laughs> the the effects of sleep deprivation can have on a person it's it's not great, and Blake, I I know exactly how you feel, but you're overworking yourself. You're you're not sleeping. You're you're pushing your teammates away, and Bla and we get a great story from Yang just uh, being Yang and telling her history about her focus. However, my point is this scene showed that like Yang cared about Blake a great deal, and that she was willing to really push her to, you know, like, relax, something that she needed. She was willing to, like, you know, get in her loved one's faces and get them to do what was needed, and I love that. The fact that she ended it by winking at Blake and asking, like, you know, save, saying she would save her a dance, saying that if she And if you feel like coming out tomorrow, I'll save you a dance. I don't know if the writers deliberately wrote it that way. Knowing them, they could have done it. Maybe it was just one hell of a coincidence, but it didn't help with the shipping. In fact, it probably fueled it. I heard it from the moment, like, I heard it like, did you deliberately or did you just accidentally write that? Come on! Regardless, it, Blake takes the advice to heart. She gets some sleep. And while she ends up going technically with Sun, she dances with Yang. They have a good time. They all have a good time. And it's kind of just fantastic to see. The next real Blake Yang moment is probably not until Volume 3, if I remember correctly. Specifically, it's the scene where the two of, like, the like Yang, is, like, right after she's been accused of breaking Mercury's legs, and everything's kind of, you know, it's the beginning of the end, essentially, or the end of the beginning. I can't remember which is which, literally and figuratively. Point is, she sees this, and she sees a similarity to Adam, which, 
maybe you could look into that a little too deeply, but I'm just looking at it from the sense that she doesn't want to go through, Blake doesn't want to go through this again, and Yang is so deeply hurt by this, it clearly affects her. And why shouldn't it? It's painful for her to see someone she cares about so deeply consider that, even consider that she would ever do anything like that. True, someone like Crow also thinks she did it, but Crow is an adult and a realist, and he unfortunately doesn't see any evidence. And that's just a fact of life. You know, sometimes stuff like this just happens, and I'm sounding like Crow. Crap. Point is, Yang is hurt by this, and Blake comes to the conclusion he lets, but says that she'll trust Yang, and she does, more than anything. And then the next moment between the two, oh god, you know, Volume 3 actually gave us a decent amount of them, but every last one of the shipping moments between the two were kind of painful. For instance, we get this harrowing bit where Blake has no choice but to confront Adam. And then Yang shows up to try and save her, and what happens? Well, Yang, honestly, the moment, like, the clear amount, I mean, the fact that he, Adam, I hate his guts, but the fact that he used the term everything you love when describing how he's going to destroy everything Blake loved, yeah, didn't help. And then, of course, the look on Blake's face right here where it's like, oh, my God, no, no, I can't, don't, don't. Because she knows how dangerous Adam is, both in his skill and in just who he is. And frankly, and that makes sense. He's just too dangerous for Yang to handle. But Yang, being the hothead that she is, goes right into her semblance and being pissed, jumps into it, thinking she can handle it. And what does he do? He cuts right through her aura. Be and what and and that's not even the important part. What that happens later. But the important part here is that she jumped into it, angry, fueled to the brim with power because of her semblance, because she cares about Blake. She cares enough about Blake to get so pissed off about the situation she sees as Blake being in danger. And Blake is in danger, mostly emotionally, because again, uh, even though, although Adam being the nutter he is, tries to kill Blake regardless which shows that he, despite saying he wanted her to stay alive, to suffer and see everything she cared about burn, he still was crazy enough to forget about all of that and cut off her dang head. Thank God it was a clone, because like everybody else, for that brief second before it dissipated, I was convinced that they actually killed off Blake. I had a freaking heart attack. Seriously, Rooster Teeth, what is wrong with you? I mean, I'm impressed, but I'm also really horrified. Why? <sighs> the point is that it was a good moment for the character, and she, of course, carried Yang to safety. And, well, there are things, you know. But then we get what happens by the end of Volume 3, specifically the conversation between Ruby and Yang, which is so, so painful and so well executed, and so well acted, but so painful to watch. And Yang, Yang expresses her pain about the situation, that she doesn't care, even though it's clear that she really does. And it's obvious that the reason for it is because, yeah, Weiss was forced away, but, Ye but Blake left. And she clearly, because of what happened with, with Raven, even though she didn't, she, it took her a while to even find out. Not even Jess Raven. She says it later on. My mom left me. Ruby's mom left too. I'd be willing to bet that deep down Yang does consider Summer her real mother. But at the same time, yeah, they both left. And even if she learned about Raven afterwards, that kind of has a strong effect on her. Obviously, I mean, she went into the woods with her little sister in a wagon and almost got killed if it wasn't for Crow. So yeah, clearly she has some abandonment issues, and Blake just leaving the way she is doesn't help. And uh, yeah, that just turned out unfortunate, you know what I mean? But then, you know, there's like everything that happens later. We like see how much, true, like the only other thing, notable things are just the stuff about how Blake, you know, cares so much about her team as we learn later about how leaving them and 
was to protect them because she cared about them and she wished they'd hate her for every for leaving. And the only one who had that sort of mentality was Yang. And I'm sure we'll still get a confrontation about it, but everything that's happened since then, everything from, you know, this... Are you still mad at her for leaving? Oh, whatever gave you that idea, Ruby. No, I'm totally fine. I'm great. Okay, calm down. Don't tell me to calm down! To this... How could I be there for her if she doesn't let me? What if I needed her here for me? <sighs> to this... I think it's time for an official team exercise. Who wants to play video games? I mean, if you want me to kick your butt, yeah, sure. Let me grab my scroll. Here, let me help you with that. Blake, you don't have to do that. I don't know what you're talking about. And this. Hey, I'm not leaving. And if we ever see him again, I promise I'll be there. I'll protect you. What? What? Forget it. Let's just head back. Each of these are building up to something. We're going to see something of a confrontation between these two. We need to see them hash out their issues. And unfortunately, this is realistic because it's not just going to come out. Yang doesn't want to confront it because she wants to keep the harmony and because she's willing to follow Ruby's lead, even though there's probably a part of her that's still pretty angry with what Blake did. Then there's the way this conversation went in the first place and Blake kind of screwing it up by saying the worst possible thing. And I understand she what she meant. We understand what she meant. But Yang took it the wrong way. She took it to mean that Blake doesn't think she can protect herself, even though the, her whole arc back at Patch was for her to build herself back up so that she could protect herself and her loved ones. <sighs> but the fact is that everything we've seen from these two in their major moments has shown that they work together pretty well, both as partners and as friends and possibly as uh, romantic life partners, I guess, you know, I, I hesitate to say girlfriend and girlfriend. I don't know. I'm one of those people who finds the term so juvenile, even if they do describe the relationship. But yeah, being together, being a couple, being a ship, I think these two make a lot of sense, and I love them possibly being in a relationship, but even just them being friends, them being, because I feel such a palpable connection. And that's one of the things I love about this series as a whole. I love Ruby because of the characters, because of their interactions, because of what they do together. And this is one of those moments. And I'm happy to have been able to watch this relationship build. Maybe not like everybody else because I got into the fandom a bit late, but I did catch up, and I enjoyed the ride, and I was hurt like everybody else, and I get excited like everybody else, and this, this made me really happy and sad at the same time, and I'm sure it will continue to do so for the remainder of the series, and the reason, part of the reason I ship these two is just because I feel like they're the most likely couple, after Ren and Nora, who are more or less a done deal, these two are the ones who are most likely to end up together, and that, well, uh, that's part of the reason I ship them, outside of everything else I talked about tonight. So please, this is Mike, Ringmaster of the Imagination Circus. I hope you enjoyed this little special that I just put together for you. It's uh, pretty unique, and um, yeah, I hope you all enjoy it, and if you feel so inclined, thank you and come back for more. That didn't make any sense. So, by now you might be thinking, well, why isn't the video over? What is this? Why am I in my new outfit when the rest of the video, he was in the old outfit? Well, here's the thing. Uh, I have been working on this video for a while, as you might have noticed. It's a little long, longer than most of the other videos in the Why I Ship It series. Uh... Well, here's the thing. Uh, I t well, I take a while to edit. I edit all my own videos. Uh, longer ones, of course, are going to take longer. Usually it'll take a couple of days, but then I've got some other things going on, so it may be a week, and then I needed a break for the holidays. A lot of stuff got in the way for why this video took so long to get out. And I hesitated to put it out again 
because of the most recent, or at least at the time I'm recording this, the most recent chapter. And in fact, uh, for me, which it's chapter 11, the lady in the shoe or whatever, uh, I just finished recording my reaction to that episode, that chapter of Ruby. And as such, uh, the ending for that chapter, I felt, would be the perfect way to end this video because it emphasizes my feelings for this ship. And I know that there there are still problems that need to be addressed, but I feel like this was a huge step forward, a bet, especially because they're fighting against Adam, of all people. So, yeah, um, there's that. And, um, yeah, I feel like I've emphasized this enough, so... Uh, Let's do the classic intro, out, intro, outro, and uh, then I'll, of course, mm, you'll watch this and you'll get what I mean. Uh, but yeah, this is Mike, Ringmaster of the Imagination Circus, signing off. Please, if you feel so inclined, come back and visit for more. But yeah, if this doesn't vindicate my ship... <laughs> do you really believe that? Or are you just trying to scare me away so you won't have to die trying to protect her? She's not protecting me, Adam. And I'm not protecting her. We're protecting each other.